a major project of the Arab states for the past 30 years has been to quarantine the Palestinian-Israeli conflict from the rest of the region. The very same Arabs who will tell you that it's the core conflict of the region, that the whole universe hinges on it, have managed to make it irrelevant, irrelevant to their politics, their economics, their culture. Because at some point, they concluded uh, that this conflict would be difficult or impossible to resolve, and so they moved to isolate. Egypt, Anwar Sadat made a separate peace. Jordan's King Hussein disengaged from the West Bank and then made a separate peace. These are the main elements in this Arab cordon sanitaire around the conflict. And the strategy has largely worked, as Dora Island indicated, because Israel assumed responsibility, asked for it. Um, so that Israel has had some stupendous clashes with the Palestinians, the Lebanon War, uh, the Intifada, and then the events since 2000, all of them have been contained. No peace treaties have been abrogated. No oil supplies to the West have been embargoed. No Arab streets have erupted. You know, lip service is paid. Money is shifted here and there. Peace initiatives for solving the Palestinian problem are floated. But the general Arab attitude, and here I speak of the regimes and the official classes, has been to dig a giant moat around the Israelis and the Palestinians. They prefer to leave it to the Americans and the international community to figure out what to do and to take all the risks of doing it. Now, the Arabs have been uneasy for some time because the Bush administration hasn't played the game. It gave up on diplomacy and instead pushed what the Arabs regarded as the insane idea of promoting democracy to the Palestinians. Now, the Arab st states uh, knew where that would lead, exactly where it would lead in Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, which is why those countries don't have free elections. So as the Arabs see it, the outcome of the Palestinian elections set the stage for the coup by legitimating it. And so the Arabs start with this predisposition. America broke it. America owns it, America should fix it, through its client, Israel. So their first instinct in this crisis has been to build firewalls, to isolate the problem, to declare that solving it is way, way above their pay grade. Now, still, they are profoundly worried that America can't or won't fix it, just as it can't fix Iraq and that they'll be left to deal with the consequences. And there are three things in particular that concern them about what's happened in Gaza. The first, while we call this a Hamas coup, the Arab states, the Arab regimes, see it in a longer and wider context. They regard Hamas as part of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Palestinian branch of an organization first created in Egypt in 1928, and which still represents the main opposition to regimes throughout the Arab world. Now, for the first time since the founding of the Brotherhood, almost 80 years ago, one of its branches has control of territory, a kind of Brotherhood principality, controlling a sliver of quasi-sovereign territory. Now, Egypt and Jordan, which have significant Muslim Brotherhood oppositions, have every reason to be worried about Gaza the model and the boost that it might provide for their own Muslim brothers. I think this is more of a concern in Egypt than in Jordan. First, because Gaza borders Egypt. Second, because Egypt faces a more serious challenge from its brothers. And third, because the succession to Mubarak is an open issue. But Gaza as a base of operations against Israel never caused anyone to lose sleep in Cairo. But Cairo slept well, even as the gun runners uh, were smuggling weapons into Gaza at night. But Gaza, as a Muslim Brotherhood principality, aimed also at Egypt, is another matter altogether. For Egypt, then, getting Hamas somehow back into the bottle is a priority, not for the sake of Palestine or the Palestinians, but for the sake of Egypt's own status quo. Second, the Hamas coup unfolded in a way that leaves the rulers in Arab countries very, very uneasy. Now, there was a time in the Arab world, some decades ago, when coups were a matter 
of routine. Some of the present regimes began as coups right, or rebellions. Over the years, the regimes became smart enough to thwart coups originating in the security forces, and they've largely persuaded, largely succeeded in persuading the world that the Arab world has become coup proof. And impressing on their peoples that coups are illegitimate. The scenes out of Gaza, then, are really throwbacks to another era. Uh, armed men seizing the radio and television, and the homes of the top leaders, and then the luxurious bedrooms are revealed to the cameras. This demonstrates the fragility of power. It was one thing you know, to see Saddam Hussein driven out of his palaces. After all, he was crushed by American might. But in Gaza, an Arab president, one who breaks bread with the others as an equal, was driven out by what looked like the rabble. The putschists, of course, also shamed the Saudis, who had cemented this Hamas Fatah deal that carried a Saudi label and the name of Holy Mecca. And most worrisome of all, the coup makers claim legitimacy, legitimacy because, you know, get this, they won a free election, which is more than can be said for the old coup makers who are in their palaces. So the images of Gaza, I would say, haven't put the ruling regimes on high alert yet, but they've increased their resolve that such scenes not be repeated uh, in the first instance in the West Bank. But third and most important, uh, Jordan and Egypt are anxious lest the breakup of the West Bank and Gaza thrust the Palestinians back into their laps. That is a responsibility they do not want to assume. Now, we all know the argument, if the Palestinians can't build the state, why not bring in the Jordanians and the Egyptians? Illusions have been made to it here. Um, when I say bring the Jordanians and, Pal and, and Egyptians back, since 40 years ago, the West Bank and Gaza were ruled from Amman and Cairo, respectively. Now, this is discussed, obviously, more in relation to Jordan and Egypt. Egypt hasn't ever included Gaza, but Jordan did once include the West Bank. Its older folk were Jordanian nationals. There are strong family ties between the East and West Banks. The Queen of Jordan has Palestinian parents, and so on and so on. And although King Hussein did disengage from the West Bank in 1988, Jordan has never ruled out, has never ruled out an eventual confederation with a Palestinian state. Now, the Jordanian and the Israeli press have been rife with speculation on this issue. It's spread to some of the Western media as well. No doubt this conference will contribute to it um, um, in turn. And all of this has made King Abdullah very uncomfortable. Uh, a Jordanian newspaper on Sunday quoted him as saying he was, quote, fed up talking about this issue. And then he added this, he said, quote, we reject the formula of confederation and federation, and we believe that proposing this issue at this specific period is a conspiracy against both Palestine and Jordan, end of quote. And when somebody uses the word conspiracy in this way, it points in only one direction yeah, toward Israel. Now, King Abdullah is expressing what I think is the obvious preference of Jordan and Egypt for as long as they can They'd like to maintain that moat around the Palestinians. And the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, that there is really no serious pressure to make them do otherwise. The present U.S. administration, Iran will speak to it as well, is mortgaged to the classic two-state solution and to Abu Mazen. And so is the present Israeli government. Tony Blair's appointment as special envoy by the quartet has offered the Arab states yet another reprieve. Not only must Abu Mazen fail uh, before they're summoned to act, but Blair will have to acknowledge it. That's even less likely to happen. Uh, but even if it did happen, the next option will be an attempt to revive the Mecca Accord between Hamas and Fatah. There are already people talking about it. So we're witnessing the beginning of what I would call a surge, to borrow Iraqi terminology, a last-ditch effort to salvage the old paradigm. We don't know when or how it will end, but I think it will take longer than one might think. But however the outcome of this surge looks to the rest of us, there will always be people who claim that it's working. 
for the most fervent believers in the old paradigm, there's never been a moment that hasn't been a golden opportunity to push ahead for a two-state solution within the Clinton parameters. When Israeli and Palestinian leaders are strong, it's an opportunity. When the leaders are weak, it's an opportunity. When Abbas is up, it's time. When Hamas is up, it's time. The solution is obvious, they say, and if we haven't reached one, it's America's fault for not showing resolve, and Israel's fault. It's a software problem. Um, that there might be a hardware problem on the Palestinian end is inadmissible. Now, these same people now recoil at the mere suggestion that Jordan and Egypt might be called upon to supply some of the missing hardware. And ironically, some of them are the very same people who want to fix Iraq by bringing in Syria and Iran. Now, they have no qualms about beseeching America's sworn adversaries to help it out in that crunch, but they're dead opposed to asking America's friends to do the same in this crunch. Why? Because Palestine, you see, is our responsibility. At the root of this approach is presumed guilt. The United States and Israel are solely responsible for the Palestinian plight. They alone must resolve it. This, ladies and gentlemen, is not a pragmatic approach. It's a romantic one. It isn't about providing solutions. It's about us redeeming our virtue by pursuing a just solution ourselves, thus salving our own tortured consciences. So no one in Washington has any intention anytime soon of popping this question. How much of the responsibility would Jordan and Egypt be prepared to assume? No one knows for certain, but it's quite possibly more than they're letting on now. A lot depends on what happens in the balance of the year. But if the salvage Abu Mazen effort fails, and the odds, of course, are against its success, construction of a new paradigm will become unavoidable. Jordan and Egypt will have an interest in being part of its construction so that it be done with their assent and not at their expense. If there is an opportunity for Track 2 explorations right now, this, I think, is it. It's also not too early to begin to ask Arab establishments some larger questions. Now, not a few Arab commentators have linked the separation of the Palestinians into two entities with the breakup of Iraq. In both cases, civil war has split asunder peoples who are nominally Palestinians or Iraqis along the lines of sect, tribe, region, faction. Iraq and Palestine, always tenuous creations, have gone into reverse away from nation statehood. Some Arabs, of course, denounce this as the result of an American Zionist scheme, but its real cause is the unwillingness of the Arab peoples to fully embrace the old imperial partition of the Middle East. Iraq and Palestine, remember, ladies and gentlemen, weren't invented by the Arabs. They were invented by Winston Churchill, who scribbled maps on the back of napkins. Now, if that partition has become unstable, how would Arab establishments stabilize it? Can alternatives be planned, or do they prefer them to emerge haphazardly through civil war, coup d'etat? These are weighty questions. Dealing here now with Gaza doesn't require that they be answered, but preventing the Gazification of the Middle East tomorrow demands that they not be avoided. <laughs>